which is just as important and so inspiring for all of us to see. So thank you for coming. Please welcome them and enjoy the film. And Abby is going to talk for a minute. Okay. Jump up and say, can you come to rebellious loitering? And amazingly enough, I knew what it was. And the reason I knew what it was is because another daughter of friends of mine went here and was one of the originators of this conference. So as somebody who's really old and has been in the struggle for what feels like a really long time, I'm kind of like the Nat Foles generation, you know, 30 years, that's a long time. Um, it is so terrific for me to see the next generation represented by you here because the thing that's been, you know, the hardest for all of us is to figure out who's going to take our place. <laughs> and I'm sure Judge Henderson had the same question for himself. So the fact that you're here kind of holding up the standards um, of the next generations of rebellious lawyers makes me feel really good. And so for us, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, we will be back afterwards to talk to you, and I would just ask you as you watch the film to think about whatever school you're at, and maybe you want to bring the film to that school later. Um, but thank you for coming, thank you for having us, thanks to Emma for finding us, and we'll be back in the film, so thanks very much. I got hate mail, I got death threats. I was surprised at that because uh, my analysis of I knew it was a, a, an important issue when I, I wrote uh, my decision. And I thought, well thought out, hundred something pages. And my analysis was that given the Ninth Circuit, um, which is the most liberal circuit, and more so back then than it is now, that. Given the draw, I would probably be affirmed by a Ninth Circuit panel uh, because I thought I stated the law uh, as I read it, but that I would be reversed by the Supreme Court eventually. And I thought that what the Supreme Court would do was essentially reverse itself and say it's the Seattle case, which is no longer a good law. That's the way I saw it. Um, so I was surprised at all the accusations that came with everything, but uh, my legal analysis, I was prepared to defend that. I wasn't really prepared to address that. Uh, why was it just impossible? In his whole life? Yes. <laughs> Drive the town and drove through uh, a forest area, a wooded area, 
invested or get beat up. And I try to do that. And I was going to get arrested. But as I was going through that hooded area, I thought that I may stop and I may not get out of here. So I started thinking there were a lot of curves, and as I rounded the curve, I started questioning or checking the curve that was behind me. I could speed up a bit, see how much room I could get, and try to think of ways. And I thought the sky uh, uh, didn't seem to be too healthy. I thought of knocking him out or pushing him out of the car. And it was really utterly frightening. And then finally, as I was still going through it, it came out of the woods and we were in town. And it was all over. But I think I look back on that on the scariest period of time on my other hand. You saw it like that, because that is how Sutton sees his life, and it is not how I see it. <laughs> right? So um, I think it's interesting that, you know, I thought I could sort of overcome that because I think there's, let me just say this in a perspective on the flight. But, um, and, you know, I mean, some things have to do with who are the first and most educated and most um, sort of talented person in the pool, and therefore you become the first to do whatever. So, to some extent, I mean, I, I wouldn't call that coincidence. On the other hand, and, you know, thought we'll talk about whether or not you had a life plan or something, uh, because that also was not. But I don't, I did not mean to present his life as a series of coincidences. Because, I, I mean, I tried to present, I, this is what I thought I was doing. I thought I was showing a couple of important sort of thematic pieces about him. One was that he was an incredibly hard worker from day one. The other, okay. <laughs> um, the other is that if you apply the kind of hard worker theme to his acts of judging, that he is both hands-on and does things. I mean, just as a quick aside, when we were, um, when I was here listening to the school desegregation integration panel that was happening here before, one of the complaints was that the judge never forced the city, county, or state to ever really do anything. Well, the one thing that I was really trying to say about the Judge Henderson judges is that he's, you know, he's got whoever the, the institution is by the neck trying to make sure that they change. And even if it takes 15 years to do it, he's still working on it. Um, and I felt like that was a really important model of judgment. So I, uh, I had to project the coincidence theory of history here. Um, and let's see what Judge Hinson has to say. It's a coincidence theory. I believe it. And if any of you saw Forrest Gump, <laughs> <laughs> I see myself as sort of Forrest Gump, sort of uh, person of modest means, all kinds of fantastic things happened to him uh, as he went through life. And Elvis, if you recall, <laughs> uh, and uh, all, all those wonderful things. And that's, that's the way I see my mind. I, uh, I had no clue of what I was going to do in my last semester in law school. And uh, lo and behold, John Doerr called the dean of my law school because he's a bow tall graduate. And I get this wonderful first job. That's a Forrest Gumpian kind of appearance. Uh, right out of law school, who do I meet? Start hanging out with the Martin Luther King. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it was quite amazing. And then I did much of my life. I right? teach Stanford, that portion where I worked at Stanford. I set up my own law firm. One day I gave a letter, a uh, form letter, your counselor, counselor crossed out and felt written in by somebody saying, your name has come to our attention as a kind of person, Senator Alan Cranston, is thinking of appointing to a federal judgeship. I swear I had never thought about a federal judgeship until that moment. Even then, I was going to fall for it. It was very politically sad, and I wasn't. And they said, you know, give it a try. We hear that uh, Cranston is going to appoint a woman. There's been a woman on our court, and it turned out to be Marilyn Bell, who's in the town. 
that came along and happened to me. Like I wasn't seeking uh, how to plan my career. It was the acting to things that happened. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, if this was not a, you know, a grand scheme that that was implemented, because one of the things that Judge Henderson often says is, if I had said I wanted to be a federal judge when I graduated from law school, I would have been to a mental asylum because there were none. You know, there weren't any of that. So part of it was kind of the intersection, it's one of the reasons I made the film, had to do with the intersection of American history and Judge Henderson's life. Forrest Gump had already been made by Hollywood. I wasn't making Forrest Gump too. I was making a different film. And I think it, you know, the fact that this wasn't in his consciousness to think about going to work for the Justice Department because nobody who was African American was working for the Justice Department in the Civil Rights Division, or it didn't occur to be the first minority you know, to a minority in Stanford, because that job didn't exist before. Yeah, but that doesn't make him far stuff. It just makes him the right person at the right time for the test.